Hi, thanks for coming to today's talk about Java security. What I want to do in this talk is to talk about a couple different elements in the Java ecosystem. The first thing that I want to talk about is Log4j, a relatively major incident that occurred in the Java ecosystem about a month ago that affected a, a little over half or probably about half of Java applications. Um, the second thing that I want to talk about is the security manager or how certain things in the JDK have been changing in order to make the overall system more secure and just make some adjustments that are worth knowing about. And then for open source developers, I want to talk about the role of funding and how different organizations and open source projects can get funds and not feel like they're scrounged uh, or scratched up against the walls by a lack of funding with other organizations having a lot more than you do. So to introduce myself, my name is Eric Koslo. Uh, I currently handle developer relations for Contrast Security, working to secure applications from the inside. Before joining Contrast Security, I've done a number of things in the overall software ecosystem. Um, one of the notable roles for FOSDEM or those in Fuji, Friends of OpenJDK, is I was one of the principal product managers on the Java platform itself between 2013 and 2016, working with an emphasis on security. Before that, I was a product manager of some security products that would analyze code for security flaws. And I was also a software engineer, so I sat and built software and wrote it every day. Otherwise, I'm also a news editor over at InfoQ, a technology news reporting site. And I've uh, done a couple courses uh, with Pact Publishing. Probably the most popular one that I've done is called Hands-On Cryptography with Java. That is just a lot of how to secure uh, your applications using cryptography. So the first thing that I want to talk about today is log4j, explain what that was, how it affects a lot of Java applications. But in short, um, log4j, log4shell was the nickname of the vulnerability, was a really bad vulnerability that affected a lot of Java applications. And it had a CVSS 10 because it was fully remotely exploitable in terms of running remote code execution on people's systems. The way that uh, log4j vulnerability worked is any attacker who could get a string into their system would submit a, a particular string that was expression language combined with a JNDI lookup. You can see a picture of it down in that license plate on the car over there. It's JNDI LDAP, then you give it a URL. And what would happen is any Java application that went to log that string through log4j would look up that class, try to download that class from the internet, and then execute that class to run anything that happens, or and to execute anything that that class does. So the result is any attacker who can get that string into your application to log that as regular data can typically cause your application to run their remote code. And the most common thing that people are using this for is to execute system commands. So they just do system get runtime.exec and then they pass in their own string to run all kinds of things. And that's the most common thing that people are doing here. But the result is really bad. And is it really that bad? Is this something that we need to pay attention to? It's actually a bad enough vulnerability that two major organizations in the United States associated with the government had to step in and take a, a bit of a decisive action more so than they usually do. CISA is the Cybersecurity Information Security Agency. They handle a lot of things for different federal organizations. Um, and what they did was back in mid-December, they literally came out with an edict for the rest of the government that said, you absolutely need to patch within a week or we're going to have some words with you. They can actually have words with anybody that they want to. They're a relatively good organization that can get around when they need to. Didn't matter that Christmas Eve was coming up. Their deadline was, I think it literally was Christmas Eve that you had to patch by. Similar thing, the FTC is the Federal Trade Commission that does a lot uh, with consumer enforcement. They came out with a, a notification in early January that basically said, hey, everybody, we want to remind you that we're the ones who find people who are negligent on cybersecurity. We just wanted to remind you about our enforcement powers and that we've issued fines in the past. That's not a very common thing for government agencies to do. So it demonstrates that there's a lot of attention on this vulnerability and it's something that we should all pay attention to. 
And who can exploit Log4j if we don't patch? Is it really that bad? Do I have to do it? What if I set up a system in place? Well, the way that people attack Log4j is that anybody can really exploit it on your systems as long as they can get data into your system. What I have here is just a, uh, an exploit demonstration that I'm able to use. If you look at the command on the top right, I have a class that opens whatever um, system command that I instructed to run. In this case, I'm on a Mac, so I gave it the command of open my calculator because that's the most common thing that people can do. And what happens is I just have a basic web application that logs some of the input. It logs the data body that comes in. So if I go and I make a request to that web application and I give it a data body down there on the bottom left that says LDAP, I give it my uh, LDAP location where I'm listening and I give it my class file, the JRE will go download that class file and execute it in the system context. And what happens in this case is my system executes the calculator application. And when I go to access that web request, my calculator opens. So it's nice from an exploit perspective because it works and I can show it to people, but it's really bad when other people can execute system commands on my machine. And what did good patching look like for the people who did a good job in terms of patching and fixing their vulnerabilities in terms of remediating log4j? There are a couple things that went really well. Um, Amazon did a really good job with the Coretto group. I think it was Volker Simonis and Martin Verberg from Microsoft who did some good collaboration around an instrumentation agent. And I was kind of happy that SD Times picked out a project that I worked on called Safe Log4j. But ultimately, good patching was a mix of three things. There are people who went through and they updated the Log4j library to introduce a version of the library that wasn't vulnerable. The second is, in the cases where you couldn't do that or before the patches existed, they used an instrumentation tool, which is what that hot patch for Apache Log4j that AWS did, as well as Safe Log4j. Those are tools that connect to a JRE and provided instructions on how to execute securely and effectively mitigate the Log4j library. Otherwise, another good thing was people who had an inventory and knew where Log4j was. Because when you know where, log for, when log for, where Log4j is, you can go through and you can actually patch it. Otherwise, the, the weak patching, the people who were really stressed out, they were kind of the opposite of this. They were scrambling to ask other teams. I saw a number of groups that were posting on .NET forums or demanding answers from their open source projects and saying, you need to tell us, do you use Log4j? Well, Log4j is a Java library, so it doesn't make sense that when I'm in a crisis and I have to deal with something, that I go ask a team that's clearly not affected. It's certainly fine to ask your .NET or Python or Node teams about their security posture, but not when you have to deal with an emergency in terms of fixing a vulnerability right now. Otherwise, something that was kind of weak was people who were updating network defenses because that license plate from before. The reason that license plate picture is funny is we know that we're going to log the text that we read from the license plate. Um, so, and that's not web input. You can't block that in a network level because it's part of an image processing system. There's too many ways that we get data to log to block it at a network level. Otherwise, another thing that happened with the teams that had a lot of trouble was they had no idea where Log4j was, which is why they went around scrambling uh, everywhere in order to, to deal with the problem. And they didn't make much headway because they were going to places where Log4j wasn't. But if you still haven't patched the library, please do so. Please go ahead and patch the library. If you haven't done it already, it's really prudent to do it. It's something I strongly advise that you do. If you build the software, you can update the library. Please go ahead and do it. If you, build or if you buy or license the software, maybe it's a commercial thing that you get from somebody else, you can either make what's called a software bill of materials or you can just ask the vendor for it. It's, it's possible you can ask an application and say, hey, uh, what are the libraries in this application? And you can just look to tell if it has log4j. Of course, with shading and other techniques, you want to do a, a bit of a diligence to figure out if there's any log4j classes hidden in another jar file, but you want to look. And then you can also get a patch from that vendor if it's a commercial software, or you can use one of the instrumentation-based patches that I showed just a minute ago. 
And if you rely on a service, um, you communicate to somebody upstream, like a cloud provider or something, it's worthwhile to ask them if they've patched, because if you don't have insight into their tech stack, it's not like it's not the same as a .NET team where you know that they aren't affected. You don't know, so it's worth asking. Otherwise, you really want to focus on what it is that you're defending. And in this case, there's really two things that you're defending. The first is you're defending against hackers who are stealing your data because that's what they're going to do with the log4j exploit. The second is there's regulators that are probably going to fine you if something bad happens because they've literally stepped in and reminded us that they're going to do that. So if you're not worried about hackers or you're thinking, oh, it's hard for them to get my application, maybe defend yourself against the regulator by just patching the vulnerability. Regulators, in a sense, are the ultimate advanced persistent threat because you're not allowed to keep them out. Now I want to talk a little bit about things that have gone on in the Java ecosystem. Um, one particular of note is the security manager. And while it's been deprecated in JDK 17, there are some other really nice things in there that you can use. Um, one of the big things that's been going on since about the Java 9 timeframe is the modularization of the JDK. Um, and what's happening in the modularization system is the attack surface is actually going down quite a bit. I'll move myself to the top right up here. Um, and what happens is with applets gone, the attack surface from those applets is no longer present. So a lot of the threats that used to occur in the Java ecosystem aren't there anymore. And what I like about modularity is it takes different threats and it really boxes them into a small environment. So with java.xml, which is a package and is part of the, the module system, that's where I'm going to have my XML-based attacks, my XML external entity injection, my XML bombs. If I, if I use java.xml, I might have those vulnerabilities. If I don't use java.xml and I actually J-link that module out, it can't affect me because it isn't there. Hackers can't attack things that aren't there. So by taking these threats and these risk profiles and putting them into nice boxes, it's made it much easier to secure systems because we know what's there. Same thing, there's one Java doc compiler. If I don't have the compiler shipping with the system, nobody can attack my system through things like JSP injection, where you get uh, you upload a JSP to a web accessible location and you cause the server to execute it. If the compiler isn't there, the system can't compile, which means that it can't uh, execute uncompiled code. Otherwise, another major vulnerability that people have dealt with for over well over a decade now is SQL injection. It's a way of modifying a query through remote input to take over and steal a lot of data. That's present in the JDBC, the Java Database Connectivity, in the Java.SQL module. So if my application doesn't use the Java.SQL module, it's really hard to get a SQL injection in there because I'm not using SQL at all. So by taking these threats and really boxing them into areas, it's made it much nicer to do a threat model of an application and figure out what's there. Another big benefit that I've seen here is um, the presence of JDK Flight Recorder. I really like JDK Flight Recorder. It's probably one of my favorite tools that was introduced in the, the JDK in recent years. And what I really like about JDK Flight Recorder from a security perspective is it gives you nice visibility in terms of what's happening in the system because it's really hard to secure something if you can't see it. So one of the changes that's gone into the JDK Flight Recorder recently is the ability to track deserialization results. Because deserialization is a vulnerability where people can often execute arbitrary code by providing a new body for the method in the object that they tell you to deserialize. You go to deserialize it, you ask the object what it needs to execute, and the object gives you a vulnerable payload and takes over your system because it says, you deserialize me by letting me take over your system. Not really a good bargain if you're on the end, receiving end of that, but if you want to attack applications, deserialization is regrettably an effective thing that you can use. And one of the things that I like about JDK Flight Recorder is I can actually look and I can ask a system, are you doing deserialization? Have you done any deserialization recently? If you have, what are some of the classes that you've deserialized? And now I have a bit of an understanding as to what that application is doing and I can actually go through, and if when I run something in my QA or dev environment, I can get a view of good behavior. 
I can get an understanding of the classes that I do deserialize. So I can use another feature called, um, I think it's called a serialization filter, and I can provide that list to the serialization filter and say, I only want you to deserialize these classes because I know that they're safe. So if anybody gives you any funny business with a deserialization payload, please don't execute that and please don't let them take over my system. JDK Flight Recorder, wonderful on the visibility perspective, and it gives you the information you need to secure deserialization events and some other things. Um, right, here's where I was talking about deserialization, uh, making the, the filters possible, because in JEP 290, a long time ago in JDK 9, they introduced a serialization filter, but what happened was nobody knew what classes they were supposed to provide. They'd just say, like, well, oh, you can provide a list of safe classes. Nobody knew what that was because I don't know what classes my libraries use. I might know which things I need to deserialize, but if I run on Tomcat or WebLogic or JBoss or any of the app servers, I have no idea what they need, so uh, nobody really knew what answers to give to the serialization filters. But JDK Flight Recorder can now tell you. So what you would do in this case is you'd just use your application where you'd have JFR, um, JDK Flight Recorder recording in the background, and you'd collect that list of classes. You'd collect the list of what it says it's deserialized. You would then give that, create that allow list and give it to this JEP290 serialization filter. And lo and behold, you'd know that you would only deserialize the known safe classes. And with that, you just continue your regular patch cadence of making sure that you patch your JRE and JDK in accordance with the security baseline, keep your libraries up to date, and you're pretty good. You've defended against a major class of vulnerabilities. So the combo of JDK Flight Recorder with the serialization filters is a really good security benefit. Um, the security manager is one element here. They deprecated it in JDK 17 as part of JEP 411. Um, if you use the security manager now, just be aware deprecation doesn't mean removal. It's not getting taken out in 17. It's getting marked as deprecated. So what happens here is if you don't use the security manager now, which you know most people don't, um, don't start using it. You know, could it have done something in log4j? Actually, yes, that's kind of a surprise and literally a poetic end that nobody saw coming here. Um, but just, it's not a thing to get started with using right now. If you say, oh, well, there, there's a security manager, I, I wouldn't go reaching for it. Um, could it have stopped log4j? Yes, actually, it could have done um, something with log4j now, assuming that it was in place and correctly configured. But what happens is the majority of people don't have it in place, and it, it is actually hard to configure. Probably one of the best teams, the only one I've seen really do it well uh, at scale, is a company called Elastic. And when I went looking around for um, examples of teams that had used the security manager well, uh, Elastic actually has some details about how they've configured the security manager to work in their application and how they've tuned it to defend against log4j. So it was pretty interesting to see what they had done. So good job Elastic for having used the security manager and come up with good policy files. But they were uh, relatively unique in the Java ecosystem because they built the application and they could provide guidance to the operator in terms of how to use it. And a, a lot of us don't necessarily have that level of control or the, the same things that Elastic had. So while the security manager could have done something, it's not in the right place for most people to be able to do it. And it would be really difficult uh, and probably not feasible within the time frame. So to summarize the Java security challenge changes, um, the thing that I really appreciate from the team is that the attack surface is really decreasing in Java over the, the last several years and several re releases. And what that means is you as an application developer are responsible for updating a couple different things. The first is to maintain a patch cadence with the JDK and uh, update your Java version as often as reasonably possible. If you miss a release, if you're, you're busy for a time, I understand, I don't expect perfection, just don't let your JREs languish for several years. Also, keep up to date on your libraries. There's a tool called uh, Dependency Check that you can use from OWASP. Um, GitHub has some things that they can use to automate um, pull requests to upgrade vulnerable dependencies. 
and when you run Java in production, the JDK Flight Recorder is an excellent tool to use to monitor for events. It has a lot of really nice uh, capabilities in terms of understanding what the JRE is doing and giving you good visibility. And instrumentation tools are the things that AWS, Microsoft, and myself reached for in order to deal with major events going on like Log4j. And the reason that we reached for them is they work well for security. They engage the JRE at a code and method level and allow you to make adaptations that weren't there originally. So in the case of the Log4j vulnerability, what we did was we simply disabled Log4j's ability to load remote code which the majority of people said, why is my logging framework loading remote code anyways? I don't want it to do that. Log4j team is a bunch of really nice people. It's just, um, you know, things, things happen. Uh, otherwise, uh, I make instrumentation security tools. That's the main thing that I do. Um, you're welcome to use them for free. We have a thing called Contrast Community Edition if you want to try it. Um, what you get in, uh, in use of that is you get a thing that will track your vulnerable dependencies. So you'll see where you depend on uh, different libraries that are vulnerable. If any major vulnerabilities in the world affect your application, you'll also get the ability to detect custom code vulnerabilities. And because it relies on Java instrumentation, you simply place an agent in your application and you don't have to change any code. It just automates the detection and it puts a sensor where that sensor is supposed to be. Uh, because FOSDEM is an open source project, we do have a lot of open source tools. I put a link here to developer.contrastsecurity.com where we have our GitHub location posted. Um, we have plenty of tools that are open source. SafeLog4j is one of those that anybody can use for free uh, for perpetuity for as long as they want um, to defend against Log4j vulnerabilities. It's perfectly fine. We like contributing to open source things. And if you work on an open source Java project and you say, can you help my open source project? I'd love to help your open source project. Just reach out to me. I'll put my contact details at the end. I'm looking at a lot of things and yes, I'd be really happy to help anything on your project. It's a great way of engaging uh, the community. Now, the last thing that I want to talk about is funding um, because uh, I learned a while ago a really interesting fact that paying of various open source groups is actually hard. Um, it's not that people don't want to fund you. Um, maybe that's also true, but it turns out that when you go to pay them, it's actually not easy. Um, and the, th the realm of no money is actually common in the open source organization. So you can certainly look at your own examples and go back past 2014. But in 2014, the OpenBSD group uh, almost shut down because they didn't have money to pay their electrical bills. Of course, they ran a bunch of servers and different things to do their builds. And they were literally going around asking for money to keep the lights on. That's pretty tough in order to create a major secure operating system when you're worried about your electricity bill. In 2016, something else happened with NTP where there was a vulnerability and their maintainer just had to literally say like, look, we don't have the people in order to deal with the regular influx of bugs that we have. We can't go out there and fix um, the, these new vulnerabilities that you're reporting. I'm sorry, we just don't have the capability. Like you can go report that this is vulnerable, but we'd like some help. Otherwise, another major event that occurred back around 2014, another major vulnerability called Heartbleed, where um, OpenSSL was compromised and had, I think it was a remote code execution vulnerability in it. Um, it wasn't until that vulnerability that people turned around and finally started funding OpenSSL, never mind that it was in just about every project. And I'm in kind of a unique position here because I just move around and see a lot of things. And when I joined the InfoQ editorial group, this is a technology news site where we write a lot of articles. Um, one of the first articles I wrote when I joined that team was about the EU bug bounties pr bounty program. The EU created a bug bounty program called FOSA that was designed to provide funding to security researchers who found vulnerabilities in critical open source projects. So what the EU did was they went through and they analyzed and they figured out what are some open source projects that are critical to us. And they picked a couple. The Java ones that they picked were Tomcat and Kafka and a couple other ones. And so it wasn't just uh, if you find a vulnerability in any open source, it had to be in something that they agreed to pay on. 
And I was fortunate here to be able to interview a couple people about FOSA because at InfoQ, we, we do a lot of actual research. We don't just write our opinions masquerading as news. So I interviewed um, members of the EU who are on the team with FOSA, as well as a couple other people in the, the, organi in the overall open source ecosystem. And I just asked them some questions about open source funding. And here, if you found a security flaw, you get paid up to 25,000 euros. Pretty good amount. And if the project acknowledged the bugs and fix it, what did they get? Well, it was nothing. It wasn't that the FOSA people didn't want to pay them. Um, there, there are other reasons that I'm going to get to in just a minute. Um, but I looked into the question here of why would groups pay for finding security bugs, but not pay for maintenance that would prevent them or fix them? So I found that to be a very interesting question. So that was one of the angles that I pursued when I was writing up the article. And I also talked with a bunch of people in the open source community and I said, well, what's your view on bug bounties? What do you think of these things? There's a couple other bug bounty companies. There's HackerOne, um, there's Bug Crowd, uh, a few others. And what a couple open source maintainers told me is they, they really seem to recognize the importance of bug bounties. Like they understood why security vulnerabilities and security bugs were important but they didn't really like the concept of those bounties. And one of them told me something, I think I'm paraphrasing here, but they said, um, those bug bounty programs, they create a lot of work for us because we have to validate the fixes, we have to validate the findings, we have to tell that that researcher actually found something real. And then when we do validate that, we have to go through and fix it. Like we have enough issues already, why are we paying people to go out and find more? But, you know, they're, they're good maintainers, they're good groups. You're probably a good open source contributor here coming to FOSDEM. Um, and so the, what happened was they basically, they understood why these security flaws were important, but it was really uh, unclear and kind of murky as to why you'd pay for one class of bug, but not the others. And a couple people were just joking around because intelligent people like to joke. A humor doesn't mean you're going to actually do it. But I heard more than once a, a humorous anecdote that said, if you want to get funding, just introduce a major security flaw every once in a while. Because if Heartbleed got the money when they introduced a major security flaw on accident, well, why shouldn't I introduce a major security flaw into my uh, project as well? And then those companies will pay me to fix it. Now, I haven't seen anyone actually doing this. I have seen some other shenanigans that have gone on in open source communities recently. But like this, this is a correct and sound logical argument, whether you like it or not. Um, so why is there no money for maintenance? Um, I actually talked with a couple people who could fund open source groups. And what they, they kind of told me and hinted on, especially the ones in government capacity, is that various open source groups are not actually set up in a way that they can be paid. So an individual developer, if you want to fund that developer's project, it's really hard to be able to say why you should fund that project versus anything else. And what you're doing is you're kind of hiring a contractor there without a contract. So like, how can you justify allocating funds to this developer or this project without others? There's no kind of corporate structure there. So what you're doing is you're just giving money to a, a individual person and that's kind of ripe for abuse that's occurred in different communities. I drew what I think is at least a funny cartoon down in the bottom of a politician. I grew up in the Chicago area um, in the United States. It's regarded for its political corruption. So this role of, you know, my brother runs an open source project, so that's the one we need to fund. That's what I grew up with. Um, if you have a team, a team of developers, you have like five or six people working on a project. Well, which of those groups do you actually fund? If there's no kind of corporation or no entity or no charity to fund, it makes it really difficult to figure out which of them get the money and how much you would fund them. Um, if you have a foundation like Eclipse or Apache, those are actually kind of the easiest uh, to pay because there's some entity there and it's clear to anyone looking what that foundation does. Like there's no ambiguity that the Apache Software Foundation is dedicated to open source. There's no ambiguity that the Eclipse Foundation is also dedicated to open source. So it makes it relatively more possible to contribute to those foundations. 
And there's some common models that I see when I look out in successful open source project is the role of a project um, and then an open source version of that and a group that kind of stewards and guides the open source group as well as a commercial entity that is able to sell support contracts and do some of the monetization pieces that fund people to actually work on that open source project. So in the Java community, that's been going on for about 25 years. We all know it was started by um, Sun uh, Microsystems. And there's kind of two major locations for its open source. One is the Open JDK project that's kind of run by Oracle. Um, the other is the Eclipse Foundation that runs a lot of Jakarta EE. And there's a number of mem uh, vendors in the Java ecosystem that are able to pay for support engineers and people to actually work on JDK. So you have your open source organization, you have your open source steward, and then you have the commercial organizations that really pays a lot of the contributors and gets them to work on the project. A similar thing with Kafka. Kafka is Apache Kafka. It's an Apache project and it has commercial support vendors, Confluent, and Avon is another one that I've seen in that realm. Um, so if you want commercial support, if you want to pay somebody to work on Kafka, those two organizations tend to be doing that. Cassandra, also run by the Apache Software Foundation. You've got two uh, vendors in that space. Datastax is one in particular that funds a lot of the work that goes on in Apache Cassandra. So what you have is the open source organization and then a commercial entity that is able to collect money and get uh, people to be paid to work on that open source organization, uh, on that open source project. So if you're stressed out about your own project funding, if you're working on uh, an open source project and you're wondering how can I do some of this, um, one of the ways that you can do this from the perspective of the people I talk to who could fund some open source projects is uh, to ask yourself, when somebody funds my project, where should that money go? And if it's going to go to the project, the difficulty is there's no real definition of what that project is for somebody to pay. So in this case, you might benefit from using something like Tidelift, which is an organization that uh, lets people sign up for open source support subscriptions and just sign your project up for Tidelift and you'll probably get some funding because Tidelift makes it possible for people to fund you. If you want to get money as an individual just to fund your open source project, not that you have to monetize the entire ecosystem, you probably need some sort of consultancy or LLC around the project. And what I would do is just give people the ability to buy like a minimum number of hours for you to work on the project. And the benefit there is there's something for that organization to actually buy that they can put on their books and make it possible to give you the money. So if you sell like a minimum number of hours that you'll work on triaging their bugs, fixing their bugs, consulting, something like that, um, it's possible for them to pay you to do that. And what you would do as a consulting arrangement is you'd probably sell something up so that those hours can expire on either a monthly or annual basis. And that's relatively common. Otherwise, if you do want to set up a consulting company, um, you're certainly welcome to do that. You can get a lot of contributors there. Um, you just set up a consultancy or LLC around the project and you would essentially sell support for your open source project. And that way there is something for the organizations to buy, which is the support contract from your company, where then your company goes and spends that money on the open source uh, contributor group. Otherwise, if you don't ask it from this perspective and you just say, how can people fund my project? It's really a big question on the other end, which is if I'm going to fund a project, what am I actually funding? And there's two good groups here. I was talking about Tidelift uh, in the, the last section. Tidelift is an organization that makes it possible for a company that uses open source to essentially buy a subscription to open source. So they commit a, a certain amount of money at, at every particular time, every quarter, every year. And they just say, we actually want to fund open source. Tidelift looks at their utilization and they say, you know, you use the following 12 open source projects. So we're going to take your money and we're going to divide it up in a particular way. And we're going to get it out to those maintainers in order to be able to actually pay them to work on things. So companies sign up to pay support based on what they use. You sign your project up. You get some um, s some amount of whatever money the companies pay uh, to your own project based on usage. So 
So it's a nice way of collecting something. It's probably not going to be huge life-changing amounts of money, but it's something that you can use to not feel like other people are taking advantage of you. Otherwise, um, in terms of foundations, the Eclipse Foundation has been doing a really good job in the Java ecosystem of taking over various projects to just do the work around the ability to get an open source project. And what Eclipse is doing, especially in like the Jakarta EE realm, is they do a lot of the work that makes contributions possible. So they build the ecosystem, they manage a lot of the IP stuff, they manage a lot of the contributions, community uh, uh, discussions and whatnot, and they do the things that you as somebody who writes open source code don't really want to do. Um, there's a lot of work around building a community and getting contributions and doing all of that stuff on the back end. That's what a lot of the companies do. So if you can get your project and it's something that the Eclipse Foundation would be interested in, you can certainly approach them. But what's nice about them is that they make contributions possible and they offload a lot of that back end work. I don't think they're a group. It's not somebody you go to to say, hey, can you fund me? I don't think they really do that. But they lift a lot of the ecosystem errata off of your back. So with that, the summary of what we talked about is log4j, how applications are attacked, what the exploit payload was, how essentially if you use log4j, virtually anyone who could get your system to log data could take over it by getting classes to execute on your code. Um, we talked about the security manager and how the JDK is changing, in particular, the ability to use JDK flight recorder and instrumentation based tools in order to get better visibility and defense in your system and funding in terms of open source, where a major way of thinking if you're if you're crunched about it is to look at the question of if somebody wanted to pay my project, where would that money be going from their perspective? And a couple ways that you can do that to maybe not feel so scrunched. Otherwise, if you want to talk uh, further, if anybody wants to follow up after this, I'm really happy to talk about your project. Just reach out to me through anything. Um, Twitter's probably the easiest one to just get a hold of somebody. Um, I work at Contrast Security. We do uh, some accurate instrumentation. We have an agent that connects to Java applications and is able to monitor security flaws in the custom code as well as third-party library risk. You're welcome to use the free community edition in your project or open source group. And if you just want some general help hooking it into your open source project, I'm really happy to do that. Just reach out to me so we, you can use um, the free community edition at any time you like. And if you want an open source project, we have an open source project called SafeLog4j that deals with the risk that I talked about at the very beginning. So thank you for coming to the talk. And if anybody wants to um, keep on talking, we'll be doing it over in the FOSDEM Friends of OpenJDK room. Thank you very much.